Titus chapter number 2. I've read, I have never started at Matthew 1 and read through the end of the New Testament and counted them, but I've heard there some 200 references to the return of Christ in the New Testament. He has told us that he's coming. For the child of God, the coming of Christ should not be a threat to be feared, it should be uh, something we anxiously long for. Yeah. Let's read Titus chapter number 2. I'll read and you follow along, please. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. That's uh, serious-minded, grave, temperate, sound in faith, that's sound in charity, sound in patience, all right? The aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Where else have you seen that word sober other than our text here? Sober-minded. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? We are adversary of the devil as a roaring lion, roaming about seeking whom he may devour. All right. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. The problem with this sober-mindedness for our generation is we are so pleasure-minded. Second Timothy says, speaking of this day, we are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Fun. speech that cannot, well, verse 7, and again, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness. That means our doctrine <coughs> needs to be exactly right. Now, amen. Not close because we're not playing with horseshoes and hand grenades. This is the truth of God. We've got to get it right. It doesn't matter who doesn't like it. You see, one time he's with the Lord now, and I can talk about this. Brother Kelly asked me to come over. He wanted to talk to me about something. And his son Scott was in a ministry, and, and Brother Kelly said he's needing some support. I, I want to know if I can take my tithes and offerings and send to Scott for a while. And here I'm thinking, I'm fixing to make this man mad. But I said, no, you cannot. The Bible says bring your tithes and offerings into the storehouse. Now, if the church wants to decide to support, to support Scott, the church can do it. But as individuals, you read the, the book of Deuteronomy, he said, you, you can't do with your tithes whatever you want to. That's God's, so it's hands off, so to speak. All right? So, man, I told him that. And he said, okay, fine. Never missed a beat. Never the worst in our relationship. We, we really need not fear. I need to stand for the truth. If he clobbered me and threw me out the door. Yeah. You see, the truth. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, buy the truth and sell it not. Cannot be compromised. Okay, sound speech that cannot be condemned. 
that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining. The word purloining means to be embezzling or turning profits to your own. In other words, you don't manipulate things so the money comes your way. Amen. Servants here is speaking to <coughs> employees, workers in the workplace. All right? Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now, if you believe in Mark in your Bible, put a parenthesis around God our Savior. We're going to come back to that. For the grace, verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. So this is relevant to my life right now. This is relevant to your life. It will be relevant when Silas is a preacher, if he is. That's the grandson for our, our new folks' sake. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? It, this, this fits. It's still relevant, all right? Teaching us that denying ungodliness. If it's not godly, deny it. Leave it alone. I don't know how many times I've heard people say uh, about a television program or something, well, it's not fit for the kids. If it's not fit for the kids, it's not fit for me. Nah. Well, that's kind of hard to be consistent at, isn't it? Let's see. Shows you how different we are to these things, Okay. That we ought to live soberly in righteous. Righteousness is holiness in action. All right? Verse 13 now. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You might put a parenthesis around great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. It doesn't matter if they like it or not. Preach the truth. Teach, exhort, and rebuke when necessary with all authority. Now that word, a peculiar, he redeemed unto himself a peculiar people. That word peculiar doesn't mean odd, a screwball. It means exclusively God's. We are peculiarly His. We belong to no one else. Amen. See, 1 Corinthians 6, what? No, you're not. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are His. Amen. Most of us... Uh, so, well, some of you may have not met her yet. We have a, a lady in the neighborhood. Uh, she's Vietnamese, I believe, or, or close. And she comes, and ever so often, she comes and gives me a lecture how that she owns this property. This is her church. She owns this building. This, all of this belongs to her and to her father and all of this. And so I said, okay. Show me some keys. She looked at me like that. I said, I've got a key to every door on this property. I said, if this belongs to you, show me some keys. Let's see. I may start asking her, you want some of the bills? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is your address? We, we'll start sending the electric bill down to your place. Martha. And bless her heart, she's just been misinformed somewhere. Uh, she's a little peculiar. 
That's not what I'm talking about, not what God is talking about. He's talking about being only His. Yeah. You see, we belong to God. What? No, you're not. You're not your own. Then what business do I have trying to please me so much? Right. If we'll be honest, that's a real, legitimate part of our lives is making me happy. Not y'all making me happy. But, I mean, all of us, we, we live, huh? We get frustrated in the traffic. Uh, I was uh, coming back from Bowie the other day, and uh, right where they have all of that construction on 820, when, when you come 35 south and you have to make a decision, either go 35 down through Fort Worth, or take 820 around the north side. When I got to that decision point of no return there, both directions were completely stopped. I said, so which tail lights do I want to look at? I said, I'll go 820 and maybe I can get off at Beach Street. Well, that was all fouled up. I could not get off at, Bath, at Beach Street. I was there prior to 7 o'clock, I got home at 9.25. <laughs> I wasn't ready for a prayer meeting. We get vexed and we get frustrated when things don't go our way, if we will be honest. But we're not to live for our way. Read Psalm 119 and notice how many times it make re makes reference to God's way. The way of the Lord. The way of the Lord. All right. It says here, there verse 10, I ask you to mark that those words, God our Savior. Look at verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you'll study the Greek grammar in both verses, it's one person. Amen. It's not God and our Savior, there are not two of them coming. That is, uh, how do you say this? I'm going to say flashing deity of Christ. He is God our Savior. Amen. He's coming back the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not both of them coming. He is God. He is our Savior. He is the great God. He is our Savior. Jesus Christ. Study the grammar of that. So it's the deity of Christ. But verse 13 says, looking for He's coming. He says in the Revelation, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. We are to be steadfastly looking for him. The idea of looking here is looking anxiously. We'll be anxious to see him coming. It's like when you know the grandchildren are coming. You're just anxious. I was... Uh, I just get anxious. And so when I know the kids are coming, an hour or so beforehand, because I'm always hoping for once in their lives, they'll be on time. <laughs> and I, I talk often about the boys, and I say the apple didn't fall far from the tree. In this case, it never hit the ground. Because if I tell you I'm going to be there at 9 o'clock, you can start looking for me about 8.30, 8.45. I'm not going to be late. If you want either of them there at 5, you tell them plan and everything at 3. <laughs> Where does that come from? I don't know. But I want you to understand. But I know the grandbabies are coming. I'm anxious. You know? The last time we went to Pampa, uh, Silas and Josephine were just so anxious to see us pull in the driveway. And we got there 
that their faces were just pressed against the storm door. They was <laughs> looking for us. They're anxious to see Gammy and Pop. You know? This is what this looking for the return of Christ is to be to me. More so even. We are looking for his return. In Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Not only they, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit or to understand fully the redemption of our body. We're looking for that day when we're not going to have to have uh, pacemakers and defibrillators, yeah. artificial needs. Brother Don Davis over in Fort Worth told me the other day, He's just joking about it. But he said, uh, when the rapture comes and all of these artificial parts fall off, he said, there's going to be an awful hailstorm. <laughs> you know, titanium and iron and all kinds of, I don't know about all of that. But uh, we, we're longing for that day. I, something I'm learning is the older I get, the more I long for that day. Yeah. When we're young and athletic and you know, we're in pretty good physical shape and, and nothing hurts. Uh, you know, we, we don't think about it as much, all right? But we're groaning, it says. Even we ourselves, we're longing, we're waiting for the adoption to understand the redemption of this body. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please, and verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're anticipating. We're anxious for him to get here. Had an assistant principal at the MacArthur High School. His name was Mr. Ennis. He was... Uh, just about that tall, but just about that wide. And I uh, got chewing gum, got caught chewing gum in the band class. Second offense. So I get sent to the assistant principal's office to see Mr. Ennis. And he says, uh, grab the back of that chair and just hold on. Out from behind his desk, he has a, a baseball bat that's been cut down in the wood lane. And he says, now hold on to that chair. I had already been sitting out there waiting. I had walked down the hall at times, and I could hear at times the whack when someone else was in. I wasn't looking forward to seeing Mr. Ennis. <laughs> He gave, I was going to get three licks. He gave me two. Then he stopped. He said, now turn around here. Well, Mr. Ennis did that here. He said, fill of that. I said, okay. He said, now you're really going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it broke me a chewing gum in the band class. So, all right. I wasn't looking forward to seeing him. Am I making any sense in this? We ought to be excited about Jesus Christ. We ought to be looking for him. We ought to be living like we're ready for him to get here. Luke 12, be you therefore ready for the Son of Man cometh in such an hour as you think not. We ought to be so obedient, so dedicated, so consecrated, so mindful of Christ and his pleasure. Remember the Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I am to live for God's pleasure. Now, I've shared this with you before, but Psalm 6 1 and Psalm 38 1 make reference to God's pleasure, except it's God's displeasure. The psalmist says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. You see, we need to be looking forward to the Lord's return. We look at the Lord's return in hope. Look at me in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 20. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 20. For our conversation 
That's our way of life. Not just our language, although it involves our language. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we looking for him? <coughs> Are we expecting him to come? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And so, wherefore, beloved, seeing ye look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless and account for the Lord for the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you all right so we are to be looking for the Lord. In the Revelation, he says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. We look for the redemption of our body, first of all. Why should we be looking forward, looking for the redemption of our body? We read this in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. You're familiar with 1 Corinthians 15. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must shall put on immortality. I can't tell you what we're going to look like. There will be no sin. There will be no selfishness. There will be no vanity. There will be nothing that fails to love God. Amen. See if you understand this. In, in Romans, I believe it's 7, it says the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Does your flesh ever get in the way of you loving God? I've shared this with you before. I had a, almost a traffic accident on occasion, and a guy began to yell at me, and it vexed me and it frustrated me something terrible. And so I started asking if he wanted to go to the side of the road, and we talk about this, and we a little closer fellowship if we needed to. And then old Joel says, hey, Dad, you're in the church band. <laughs> <laughs> Does your flesh ever get in the way? I know y'all can just drive through and it doesn't bother you. I miss sometimes, not very often, but sometimes I really miss that Peterbilt truck. <laughs> Oh, it was sometimes so self-gratifying to just turn the signal on, let it blink about twice, and take the lane. Yeah. <laughs> now, and it reminds me ever so often, it's a Ford. <laughs> or especially when it's a Nissan. You're not in that Peterbilt anymore. You don't outweigh them. Yeah. All the flesh. Well, our body is going to be redeemed. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 is that passage we use at funerals. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We're looking for that day where we'll be found and be in Christ and have nothing ever again corruptible. No more sickness. No more shame. No more embarrassment before God. I remind you, as I would remind myself, that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, even when we are unrighteous. He's observing. Hmm? Proverbs tells us, that's Psalm 34, along about verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. You see, and the Bible tells us in the Revelation the books were open. God is the bookkeeper. Every man is going to be judged according to his works. 
There was, there is coming a day when no longer do we have to deal with the wretched man. Now the great apostle from whom we get the, the greatest body of work of our Christian theology says, oh wretched man that I am. He didn't blame off somebody else, but he said, oh wretched man that I am. <clears throat> I sent Brother Don a text on Saturday morning of Katie's, the day of Katie's funeral. I sent Brother Don a text. I said, uh, Amen. God has dealt with the wretched man. I got up here early, had some time just to myself. I just, if I... Marilyn knows about this. We talked. I, I, I just thought it was going to be too much, too long. And I just, I couldn't get over that. And I let that become a whatever to me. It was a vexation and frustration. I got here early Saturday morning and I dealt with the wretched man. And I sent Brother Don a text. And I said, God has dealt with the wretched man. He sent me a text and he said, he's not over with yet. <laughs> <laughs> or, or something. <laughs> you know? The day is coming, folks, when we're not going to be afflicted any longer by any of this. I talk so loud because I can't hear. It's hard. Not hard. It's difficult to direct and help people in singing when I can barely hear them. You know, so uh, how do you tell them to get softer? <laughs> you can't only really tell if they're singing, you know. <laughs> you can't tell it's a thunderstorm unless there's lightning. Mm -hmm. You know, one of these days we're not going to have these problems. We look for that day. Looking for the blessed hope, the Bible says, and the glorious appearing. Here's something else. Reunion with loved ones. Amen. I don't know how to explain all of this. But the Bible says we'll sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I take that as they being representative of all the saints. As God could not list. Well he could but he did not. List every saint down through history. Not to embarrass Marilyn. But she said to me this morning. Some of you may know, 26 years ago, she had a baby she lost, carried to full term, a stillbirth. Well, that birthday still comes around today. Yeah. I've tried to remind the family, Katie's birthday is still going to come around. When my sister was killed there in Houston, my brother and I and the younger sister, we tried to make sure and communicate with mom and with dad on, on, on those important days, you see. Well, look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, please, and verse 13. Now, this is a very important statement, not like other statements are less important. But when Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, he's saying... Don't live without this knowledge. Know this. Let this knowledge be governing your life. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that ye which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, or because of this blessed truth, comfort one another. 
You know, so all of these we's and them's uh, are telling us there's going to be a time of reunion with the Lord. We look for that. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter number 8. Verse 11 and 12. I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Children of this worldly, ungodly kingdom. All right? So we, we're the, the redemption of our body. We look for the reunion with loved ones. Thirdly, we look for the coming of Christ for the rewards of our service. The Revelation 22, verse 12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. I've heard all kinds of discussions about rewards in the millennial kingdom, which is, to, if I understand that right, the millennial kingdom is still earthly. So there is a heavenly reward, heavenly kingdom that we look for ultimately. All right? Uh, there's a lot of this I'm not real dogmatic on because I don't know that I have all of the answers. But I understand this. He's coming. And there are promised eternal rewards for the child of God that would be faithful. What I can't understand, what I have difficulties with, I'm just confessing something to you. I struggle with people that are happy enough to say they are saved and then that's all they want. You know? I mean... We have presented to us a heavenly buffet and some people just seem to be satisfied with a glass of water. If that makes sense. Man, I don't want the water. I want all of it. Amen. You see. So we strive for these things, for our rewards. Uh, a renewed heaven and earth. Second Peter, please, chapter 3. There are places in the United States that I, I would like to see, I, 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 and I don't think I ever will. I'd like to see the Yellowstone Park. I'd like to see the great sequoia trees. Uh, I'd like to see the Pacific Ocean. I'm going to be standing on the mountains looking out of the Pacific Ocean. I don't think I want to be flying over. <laughs> Coward. You know? Uh, anyway. A renewed heaven. Second Peter, please. I asked you to turn there and then I didn't. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. What that means is we don't have any clue when. I saw a sign on a church marquee one time. 